Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. Did you enjoy the Super Bowl? Did you watch it? No parties? Okay. Today, as usual on a Monday, we're going to review our plans for the week, talk briefly about the assignments. In fact, I will also go back in time and talk about the assignments, the two assignments that were due on Friday. In, in case there was any misunderstanding about that. And then I will spend today's class with a presentation that was posted earlier about Google, but I need to go back and talk about some of the content of the presentation in order to set the premise, prepare you for the next written assignment, which is about Google. And I also prepared a set of notes that should serve as a guideline for the studying of chapter two of the first textbook, what is the history of knowledge by Peter Burke. I have on the schedule, as you see here, even chapter three, but that would be too much. I'm lucky if I can finish both the presentation, the quick presentation of the notes about chapter two and the other presentation about Google, do you Google that I placed on a different tab? That'll be the time that we have. So let me go to the podium and show you week four. I made very few adjustments really to the original plans that were published initially. As I said before, today, We'll talk about chapter two, we'll talk about Google, and we'll talk about chapter three, which was already an assigned reading at some other time. And uh, I'll see if I can provide notes. The idea of the notes is to give you the most relevant points to focus on, because once again, in a book such as the one produced by Burke, there are so many names, so many examples, etc. but this is not, the purpose of the reading is not to memorize all that minute information, it is to get the concept, use the examples as an instrument to understand the concept. You will not be uh, interrogated, you will not have to write an answer including all those details. On Wednesday, we will start our three weeks devoted to the next digital app, which will be Evernote. And as usual, I will provide instructions on how to get the free plan with Evernote, unless you yourself have a paid plan. Of course, I know that there is at least one element one advanced feature that I failed to include in my demo of Notion Wednesday and Friday of last week, which is syncing. I also went very quickly uh, in my presentation about tags, tagging and filtering. So on Wednesday or Friday, I will also go back to Notion and complete my presentation of Notion. As usual on Friday, we will watch at least a video about Notion, people who use Notion, what are the advantages. Notion is very popular. And as I've, see, as I've said before, Notion is the digital app of this kind with the largest base of subscribers. Okay, so um, Evernote uh, is uh, worth more than a million paid subscribers, whereas Notion can claim to have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, but we don't know how many of them are just subscribing to the free plan. These are the assignments. There is no written assignment. And I will provide enough instructions and then go through a hands-on activity on Friday so that by Friday, you can start creating your first page in Evernote, and that will be the second digital assignment 
after the creation of the page in Node. Let me clarify by going back to the syllabus. These are the five assignments of the semester. The one about Evernote will be the third, okay? They're worth 15% of your final grade, which means each one is worth three points. There are two written assignments, My Digital Life, which was due Friday, Google Me This, which is due this Friday, both to be posted inside a Notion page to be shared with me, whereby you invite me using my email and granting me privileges, editing rights, and commenting rights so that can, I can place my comments, which will include, once I'm done, the grade. I've reviewed and graded a number of the assignments I've received, but not all of them, maybe a third of them. And I will continue and be done in a couple of days, by Thursday at the latest. So two digital assignments, one was due last Friday, the other is due this Friday. And then you have three digital assignments, which entail the creation of a page or a small series of pages and sub pages in each of the main digital app demoed and discussed during the semester. The page on Notion was due on Friday. Notice there are two different assignments. A, a few students misunderstood and included the features, bulleted list, videos, embedded images, links, etc., inside my digital life, but it was actually two different assignments that were due last Friday, okay? And the next digital assignment will be the creation in a page of a page in Evernote, and the last digital assignment will be the creation of a page with the last digital uh, software, server-side software called DocuWiki. So, if you misunderstood and you only did My Digital Life, you didn't create the page in Notion, please do complete your assignment. It is overdue, it was due Friday, but if you haven't done it, and actually I still have a few, a small number of students who haven't submitted either My Digital Life or Notion and have not requested an extension, please complete your assignment because there are points associated, there are three points of your final grade associated with each assignment. Even with a small penalty for lateness, you're better off that with no grade at all about these assignments. If you couldn't complete the assignments because on Friday or past the Friday deadline, you realize that you weren't ready, because you've joined the class late, because you need more time, because you need my assistance, because you need to work with me, just let me know, but make plans as soon as possible. So even if you haven't submitted the homework and you need more time and my support, let me know. Let me know that you're aware that you missed the deadline. Let me know what I can do for you and what your plans are to finish such as, I need until Wednesday, I need until Friday, I'll come to your office hours, or uh, can I see you on Zoom one of these days, suggesting what time, what day you would be available, that would be convenient for you. Okay, any questions? And as I said, what I'll do is, for the assignments that I haven't graded, reviewed yet. I'll just continue to review them and I'll leave my comments and the grades in the comments of the Notion page. So that's where you will find that eventually in a matter of days. Oh, uh, okay, so let's go to the Google presentation. This, the link to this was posted 
in one of the previous weeks. You can easily find it. It's a, a big bookmark. Uh, as you can see, this is a page done with DocuWiki. Um, I had created a wiki for this class before I moved. I transferred the contents into Notion. I can also show you that through a series of plugins, I can do different things inside this wiki. For example, through this icon that shows a tripod, which is produced by a plugin called S5. I can move on the fly from a regular format to a PowerPoint like or a Google slide like format whereby I have a series of slides, which is very practical because all I had to do in order to enable this feature after I installed the plugin was to put tilde, tilde, the double tilde is the code for a plugin in DocuWiki then the word slideshow in capital letters, then of course the closing tags, tilde and tilde, again the tilde is the circumflex, this kind of character that you find on the keyboard. And that one word, that one short line was enough to produce this effect, whereby I can go through a text and the text becomes a series of presentations and I have, I can jump to a slide etc etc and I can also add notes whenever I put let me show you I didn't have notes for everyone everything here there it is so simply by placing a you know, horizontal line at any point in this presentation whatever follows the horizontal line becomes a set of notes that are not projected on the screen and can only be read when you visit the page in its regular format. Otherwise, the plugin simply takes anything that starts with a heading to be the next slide and transfers the content onto the screen. Okay? And, and Everything is formatted according to a template written with CSS, which is a subset of HTML responsible for the application of formatting. So as far as the colors, the fonts, the kinds of bullets and uh, levels and sub-levels, if I know CSS, I can modify the template. Of course, the plugin comes with five templates, but I can modify them and customize them if necessary. So this is a very simple presentation about Google. Simple because of course, uh, there is a literature about Google. There are so many scholarly books. And if you visit the bibliographical page, the, the bibliography in uh, the website, you will find just there probably 15 or 20 books, major publications, monographs, focusing on Google, the culture of Google, the knowledge industry, knowledge society. We'll just go through the basics for now, okay? And my presentation started with, let me, okay, let me focus. My presentation in the past started with a discussion of how the educational system and particularly academia, universities, how higher education changed in terms of its basic principles, the rules of the game, if you will, going from the end of the 20th century and the beginning of this millennium and the 21st century. I will not go through this point by point. You can read it. I'll just summarize the ideas behind them. And then after you read everything in the presentation, you can ask me questions uh, in, in a one-to-one -one setting. 
but basically the idea for the first slide is that the universities of the past, the path followed by a student, including myself as someone who went to a university in Italy during the 1980s, it really was about a social test, a social test of compliance. Why did you have to go through so many hurdles in order to graduate? And take the case of Italy for me as a student who entered the university system, which in Italy was only slightly different than in other Western countries in 1982. At that point in Italy, the graduation rate for anyone entering the university in 1982 was across various disciplines under 20%. Meaning that at best one student in five, one out of five students who started the university in 1982 would ever finish and get a degree. But graduation rate could be lower than 5% in some areas, such as physics or chemical engineering, etc. Why was it so difficult? Was it really because it was unfair? Was it really because students were not prepared? No, it was because the university was not about knowledge. Of course I was knowledgeable, and many of my peers were. It was still quite difficult because university, Western universities, and particular universities in Italy at that point, had been designed for the middle class, for the so-called bourgeoisie, for middle to upper class families of educated people, and students, even brilliant students, such as I was, who came from a family where both parents never finished high school. My parents were both high school dropouts. It, it was not because of uh, their uh, skills. In their case, it was a generational issue. Both of my parents were born in 1927. They were supposed to finish high school between 1944 and 1945 when the war came to my hometown and, the, and my city between 1943 and 1944 was bombed about 10 times a lot of people died and the the the, the practically the whole younger population of the city was kept out of school and whenever possible sent out of town so that they could survive the the bombing and once the war was over most people found a job. If they didn't come from a wealthy family, they didn't have the luxury of resuming school and finishing the school, the studies they had interrupted. So university for someone who was not trained into the mindset of an academic career was more difficult. Someone who didn't have a library in the house or someone who couldn't afford to buy the books and had to rely on libraries, etc. because especially during that time, it wasn't just one or two textbooks per course. The list of reading could have eight, 10, 12 different books for each class. So it was mostly about this kind of test. Are you able to execute complex orders given by someone else? Are you able to become compatible with people who come from the middle to upper class or the people who will be middle to upper class, okay? So it was mostly, do you have or can you acquire the social qualities that will allow you to interact with people from a certain section of society? That was what university was about, not whether you can read a book, understand it, and, and then uh, uh, complete an exam based on that. It was much more than that. What is the university about? And 
what takes you into the job market. It's not really the same kind of social game based on individual compatibility. Are you compatible with members of a certain group in society that you belong to or that you will be a member of once you acquire a high paying job? It's mostly about knowledge, right? But not simply about the content, the core content of the courses. Again, what is that you notice going from class to class to class? It's not just that the core content is different. What becomes, what makes it complicated or even maddening? What is the changes from class to class? When you look at syllabi, when you look at the classes you're taking this semester, what makes them different other than the topic? Any ideas, any suggestions? Yes? Uh, the layout of the classrooms. The layout, the physical layout of the classrooms? Like on the desk bars, like for these ones. Okay, well, yeah, well, especially for Stony Brook, you can have so different, different furniture, different places, different buildings from different ages. I would say something, something more. Think of the syllabi. Yes? I feel like it's like more programmed Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, good. I, I wasn't aware of that. My sense was that uh, most, almost everyone use, use Blackboard. Okay, good. I, I'm happy because I've never been a big supporter of the unified model, just use Blackboard. Okay, that's one thing. Tools, formats. What else? Different classmates. Different classmates, okay. What else? I suggested syllabi. You don't find classmates in the syllabi. Different professors? Different professors, different personalities, etc. But those are not exactly in the syllabi. Some maybe more exam-based and some more like project-based. Yeah, we're getting closer. We're getting warmer. Degrading. Yes, we're getting even warmer. Just give me a generic term to define those things that you find in the syllabi. Yeah, instructions, getting closer, but it's not the term because I want a term that I want to transfer into your future workplace, right? And those terms are specific to academia. Different syllabi means different what? Different course, is it? Different? Is it course? Course? Like, yeah. like different subject? To topic, yeah, but that's not the issue really. Different rules? Different rules. Okay, that's the warmest we've gotten to the word. I would call them different policies, right? And policies can be the policy uh, describing how you have to behave in class or how you have to submit a, an assignment or the rubrics uh, using which assignments will be evaluated, assessed, etc. So different policies different protocols, you, you may call them. I would say policies is the best term because it is immediately transferable into a work environment. What will make your future job difficult? It's not simply the fact that first impact, you have to apply the knowledge you have obtained into your work environment. That is say you have to go from abstract intellectual to practical to the application of those notions. Yeah, that is one side of the equation, one, one thing that will make adjusting to your work, to your job, difficult. The other thing is that almost every organization, including the university, and universities were not like that 50 years ago, goes by policy. The difficulty is not I have the knowledge, and now I have to find a way to apply that knowledge to a specific task or project. The difficulty, both here and in the future in your job is, I have the knowledge, I have the skills, but I cannot just do the work. No, I have to do the work following the policies that are enforced by the supervisor, your professor, or by the organization. So, I have to play the game by a certain set of rules. I cannot just improvise. And it doesn't matter if I deliver a qualitative product. 
a good report, etc., unless I followed those policies. So the real difference is that universities up until the 1970s were free-flowing, and, and the change did not occur uh, for another 30 years. The transition took several decades to complete, right? Meaning that a university professor until the 1970s could do whatever they wanted. They were not subject to any kind of enforcement of policies, any kind of template for their syllabi, or not even syllabi. When I went to university, even after Florence, I went to Canada, and I spent four years at the University of Toronto, one of the most prestigious North American universities. Even then, by that time, it was 1990 through 1994 for my master and PhD. Even then, some syllabi were half a page. Can you imagine a syllabus of less than a page? Why? Because it didn't matter. They didn't have to submit the syllabus for anything. They, they could do whatever they wanted in the class. Okay? Which is what attracted me right, to the university environment. I said, I'm psychologically not geared to respect authority, to be compliant, uh, I'm pathological. I, I want to do. I want to be creative. I, I don't want to have anyone telling me how to do things. The university is the environment where I can thrive, and an office is an environment where I, I would fail. The same thing with school. It was difficult for me because why do I have to learn what you, the teacher, are telling me? I, I want to read my books and learn things my way. That was my approach, and it worked. I, I, to, to, to a degree. It was expensive in terms of resources, time commitment, but it worked. So everything at this point, if you're an employee, it doesn't matter what level, even at the managerial level, you have to, to follow a set of policies. So it's all about testing your knowledge and your ability to survive in an environment that is driven by policy. And where whatever you decide and operate, you don't have the discretion that an employee could have, even at the lowest level, an employee of the 20th century had some discretion, meaning they could, they could justify uh, deviations from the rules, exceptions, they did it all the time, and it wasn't the end of their career if they got caught. Now, you have to do everything by policy. And so, it is not just about the knowledge of the core contents of the courses is about absorbing the idea that policies dictate how you do things in an environment. That kind of knowledge becomes fundamental and even more important than the topics because after all, you could learn by yourself just by using YouTube or Coursera or any kind of free accessible platform. It is not that difficult. What you're being subjected to is conditioning. You're being conditioned to operate within a certain set of rules, within a context where policies become very relevant. Okay? I've already discussed the contents of this slide in the very first class, how you go from Western civilization to the knowledge society from the idea that in culture there are things that are more abstract, more intellectual than things that can be applied and then things that among those that are applicable to reality can be monetized to the idea that knowledge altogether is a financial asset, is a product and can be monetized in different ways. <clears throat> Let's talk more specifically about Google. Okay, Google is the most successful search engine. The success of Google is based on the claim that they have almost all of the knowledge stored on the internet on their server. Of course, that's just a claim. I've already mentioned that not everything on the internet is being indexed. I mentioned how with just one text file with a line, you can prevent Google bots 
from indexing your pages, even when those pages are public. And then, of course, we know that there, are, uh, the, the, there is the, the dark web, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is almost everything, but keep in mind it is not everything. How is it being indexed by Google? Literally, every single token, every single word, but also semantically. So you put a string, string inside the search box and you find not just those words, but also words that are semantically related. And it is not indexed historically, right? That has been attempted at different times, but you don't find, you don't have access. They do, but you don't have access to the contents of a page as the page appeared two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. What is being offered to you as the user, that is called quick keyword in context, right? Because when you look at the results, you see the title of the page, which is clickable, and then you see three lines, usually it could be two, depending on the size of the screen, and the words you're looking for are usually in bold. This is what, what is being offered by Google normally. However, keep in mind that Google will routinely change their interface and change the format, the template of what they offer, either for a period of time as a test to measure the reactions of the users or for a subset of users. Especially if you sign in. Of course, if you, even if you don't sign in, Google knows who you are, right? Because they can use the location to identify you, the device to identify you. But of course, they encourage you to sign in. If you, for example, if you don't sign in and you do a lot of searching, compulsive searching is what I do, for example, when I do research, when I write, I'm always looking for something. And if you don't sign in, much sooner it will happen that Google says, tell me you're not a bot. Show me you're not a bot. Click this box. Show me within this picture what are the school buses? What are the bicycles? And have you noticed if you've encountered those tests that they always have to do with streets and what you see on the streets? Have you seen those images where you have to click on the boxes? Why? Is it just a pure test or are they gaining something out of you? They train the algorithm to, to detect more stuff based on... What's their research. end goal? What are they using that for? For, for bots, I guess. I don't... What kind of bot? Um, Tell me. Think of a Google bot that needs information about streets and what you find on the streets. Uh, you, you, Hillary, or anyone else, right? You, you can feel free to jump in. What is Google doing with streets? Maps. Yeah, but that's not a bot. Well, it's, it's a car that takes pictures, etc. And please, Google, send the car to my street because you haven't been there since my house was built and I see shrubs where my house is. So please, send those cars around. But what else is Google keeping on the streets, especially in California? Yeah, it's more than a small subsidiary, right? They don't publicize that a lot, but they have data related to millions and millions of miles traveled by self-driving cars. And a good self-driving car will need to identify those objects. So you're training their algorithm also when you're working on those puzzles. So. I was saying keyword in context is what it gives you at some point. I can tell you that in January, for a few days, I lost the quick completely. Google was not giving me the word I was looking for in bold. It was just giving me random lines. And you know what I suspect? 
I suspect that they knew that I was just looking at those words without ever clicking on the pages. Because what I use Google for, I'm not a native speaker of English, so I know that something can be said or written in English, but I don't know if it is idiomatic, if it is commonly used, or used with the meaning, with the nuance that I need. So I just look for examples and I observe them. And then I decide, yes, this is how it should be. So I never click. So I think they were trying to force me to click because they monetize those clicks, right? Okay, then what is Google offering you? Some AI, some limited uh, works such as I can type one euro to US dollars and that will come out besides giving me the page I'll have that I can type in the search box what's the next flight to Los Angeles from New York City or when is uh, this flight landing in New York City in Canada and the Kennedy Airport and I'll have that I can have calculators of different kinds such as a loan calculator at the top of the page okay that is also part of Google and of course you know that Google also is very active with maps well they could be slightly more active and update those maps they bought Waze a few years ago which was more popular Waze though was the crowdsourced version of maps right because in ways if you've used it as the user I can say I well I'm driving I can signal the, there is a an accident here there is a car on the side there is a police car on the side etc they bought that they have Google assistant and a version of the assistant which is similar to Alexa although they're basically both the assistant and Google home infuriating because Sometimes they don't understand the most basic uh, things. The other day, uh, Saturday, I asked uh, Google Assistant on my phone, uh, show me the schedule of trains from Ronkonkoma to Penn Station. Couldn't find it. Well, well, provided an answer, but the answer was not directly what I was looking for. So you never know. They bought YouTube, right? So you know what is going on with YouTube, right? And the idea of fake news, disinformation, uh, etc. Well, YouTube has the match to Google. The idea is approach the totality of video formatted information that you can access. So you know that they cannot really play that game as widely as they claim they should or that they feel uh, entitled and uh, feel as, as a mission, because if YouTube doesn't give the impression that you find everything there, all videos, then you don't really attract the users that they want to. Because what is that Google is monetizing in, in one word or, or, or two? Is knowledge the end goal? the totality of data, is that the end goal and what is being monetized? Clearly not. Nothing has changed from 2000 years ago. It's not like philosophy or whatever you can read through Google has value. That is secondary, right? Having knowledge, having the internet there is secondary to what? What is that is being monetized? And again, it's not you clicking on ads. Again, it looks that way, but it's a simplistic view of internet of, of Google. Google doesn't make a huge profit. It's not one of the largest companies in the world because you go look for something and then you press on the ad. That's not the case. What is the kind of knowledge and information that is the financial asset of Google? Facebook to an extent, YouTube to an extent. Would it be like the data? What kind of data? What is the most valuable data? It's not the content of the internet. What is the really, when, when you think 
anyone can do Google, right? If I have enough servers, I, I put the internet there and, and I compete with them. Why should I buy Google? Why should I pay $2 trillion to buy Google? What is that is valued that much? It's not the contents of the servers is it in the, general. Is it the user data? User data. What kind of user data? Um, it's like how do they behave in the internet? Yeah, like, patterns of use. Mm -hmm. Because that way is not simply like TV. I'm watching a Western movie and they show me a certain kind of commercial. I'm watching the Super Bowl and they show me another kind of commercial. Where that's good, customization, but pretty rudimentary. In the case of Google, they know so much about my searches and my patterns, the kind of websites that I visit, I click on, that they're promising whoever is paying for those ads that those ads will be customized, will be tailored on the exact patterns of use of those users. And even though they claim that they don't collect specific user data, meaning that they're not selling the, uh, the, the, the companies that advertise what you, John Smith, Jane Smith, are doing on the internet, they still sell because that's illegal in some states and in some countries. They can claim we don't collect user data simply because they have data sets about a single user without the name attached to it. But you can get the name easily through the devices, the addresses, the places. This person is spotted at, right? Try to disable Google Assistant from your phone. Half of the things don't work. And you have to go through hurdles, right? Because Google Assistant is not there to help you. It's there to track you. Where do you go? Which stores, right? Which places? What do you see on the browser, etc. So that's the financial asset. In fact, at some point, Google, a couple of years ago, bought Fitbit for $100 million. Now, Fitbit digital watches are not that good. Especially at that time, they were not worth $100 million. What made the valuation of Fitbit that high? Just biological data from the users, right? Because they collected and stored on their server everything that the sensors of this watch registered, right? Your, your heartbeats, your sleep cycles, everything. This is what Google valued in the excess of $100 million, okay? This is what being sold. So the totality of knowledge is just there to attract you there, right? To lure you into the search page. What they sell is not your eyes on the screen and your eyes watching a certain kind of ad. What they're selling to the companies is so many data about each user that they know whom to target and how to target that specific user, okay? And of course you have Google doing uh, the OS in the Android phones and the Wear OS for the digital watches, good or, or bad that they are. How do they work their magic? It's not just that they offer the totality or close to the totality of knowledge on the internet, is that it is ranked. There is a hierarchy based on relevance, and it does work, right? They developed this system initially called PageRank. They claim they abandoned that circa 2016, 17 for a different kind of algorithm, and we don't know about it. But basically is the more links direct to a page, the more relevant it is, the more valuable the content is, but it's not just a game of numbers because otherwise I could create fake links from a variety of fake websites and gamify the system, bring my, the ranking of my page higher, which used to be possible. No, one link is, does not count as one. There are links that are more important. If a valued page contains link to another page, then they give value to each other, they bring each other up, etc. And 
the whole system is a variation on what was popular circa the year 2000. In the early 2000, it was all about crowdsourcing, right? Wikipedia was the, the same. Wikipedia started as a private encyclopedia, paying editors and offering a subscription, and moved on to being entirely free and crowdsourcing the work to a community of about 150,000 editors, okay? And you know that some of this is crowdsourced, you can see immediately with autocompletion. Although autocompletion is based partially on the searches done by people, partially on their attempt to customize for you specifically, to send you somewhere. And keep in mind that in any kind of marketing game, the basic law is you never give the customer what they want, okay? What do you think, Oz? Well, you have to give them what they want, but if you give them everything they want, they don't come back, right? At this point, Ford or Toyota could give you the perfect car, but if they gave you the perfect car, you would keep it for 10 years or 15 instead of five, right? And if they gave you all the features, even on the smallest car, then you would never try to jump up one level. So every level of car has to be disappointed in some way. Cheapest kind, terrible suspensions, and some parts are subpar even if they save pennies or dollars, really. It's, it's incredible the kind of game they play on cars because they're not trying to save money with cheaper parts on the least expensive car. They're simply trying to make the car visibly uncomfortable so that you would desire and feel the difference if you had a better car. But each level has something missing. It's, it's planned to the point where some cars, uh, I have a good example in the, the second Fiat 500 that I owned. This car was a turbocharged model, and electronically, the output, the power of the car, was downsized by 20%, electronically. So they didn't save anything. They just wanted to make sure that if I drove the car, it was not fast enough, and I would say, maybe I should have spent 4,000 more for the Abarth model, uh, which makes 20% more power. And in fact, uh, people who are tinkerers, uh, could simply buy a gadget and reprogram the ECU, the electronic control unit, and not only I got the power of the Abarth, I programmed it to have, not 20, more, 30% more power than even the next model. And the engine is still running after eight years. It's not like I'm endangering the life. So it's all a game. It's all a game. The same was done for computers where Intel during the 1990s was disabling on the chip some features that were built in. So they weren't saving any production money. They were just manipulating the market, right? Trying to steer customers towards certain chips, ch certain kinds of computers. It, it wasn't about saving money. It was about driving sales in a certain direction. And the other thing you do, so, Again, don't expect Google to give you perfect results. They could give you better results, they won't, because you have to keep looking, searching, clicking, coming back. And the other thing you do with clients is customize, right? You want to customize the searches based on the user, but you also want to randomize them. Because if, if this profile is driving everything, if I have a perfect profile of you as a user and I only give you what you want, there is a limit to what I can sell you, right? There is a plateau that you reach. You think you want these things. So I have to convince you that you want other things. And in order to test what you react to, I have to randomize this a little. Let me this time circulate the attendance.
so that you don't have to spend any time at the end of the class, which will come in five minutes. The simplest example, what is that supermarkets do? Are, are you guys going to buy groceries or your parents do that and you don't know intimately a supermarket like a family dad, right? I'm in charge of groceries. So what, will, what is that a supermarket will do once or twice a year with their staff? I don't think they're around. Right, why? Why do they change the layout? For impulse buying? Yeah, because they, you would normally buy the same things and go, oh, here I buy this kind of apple, go here I buy this kind of pasta, I go there I buy this kind of coffee. All of a sudden, I don't find the things and my eyes are presented with other products. And I might say, maybe I should try this. I've never noticed they have this kind of coffee. I never noticed they have these kinds of pasta, etc. So you shake things up in order to explore the boundaries and expand the boundaries of what the customer will do. Same thing with Google. And that's why Google sometimes is kind of quirky. And you'll find among the first hits things that are a bit strange. But in terms of not offering you anything, everything, Google will change the results. Every time you do a search, you will get the results that are slightly different or in the case of Google Books, because as a scholar uh, and a scholar of the past, often I uh, studied the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, technologies during that time, hard technologies such as the automobile. For those periods, I, I, there are so many books, it's incredible, but I read a book, then I go back, and another time I, find, I look for the same book, and they tell me it's not there, right? Um, this morning, since I teach another class on Machiavelli, yesterday, last night, I was looking for the 1532 edition of The Prince by Machiavelli, the first published edition, and I know it's there. And I wanted to take an image of a page for the course. And it wasn't in the list. It's not there. Of course it is there. It's just playing with me, right? Because if I don't find it, then I'll be forced to look around and see other things and click on other things and they'll gain more information about me because I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so what kind of information? I think I'll stop here because it is 11.25.